martyrs and faithful who have lived, suffered, and died for the gospel of Jesus Christ, as well as you, my brothers and sisters, to witness my confession and pray for me to our Lord God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. May the Almighty and merciful Lord grant us pardon, absolution, and remission of our sins. Amen. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself, and with his authority vested in me, I absolve you of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Show us your mercy, Lord. Amen. Lord, hear our prayer. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Grant, most gracious Father, that of purity of heart we may worthily fulfill this holy action, established in remembrance of the Last Supper and the death of Jesus Christ, and for our sanctification and salvation. Be present among us, Jesus, our most perfect Master, because you said there were two or three are gathered together in my name, you are among them. We also ask, Lord, that through this holy liturgy we may experience a spiritual revival and a better understanding of your holy will bringing us together in one great family, guided by your commandments and by love, truth, and justice. Amen. And may we say together, let us praise the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, invisible, revealed in triune power in all time, now and forever. <coughs> the Lord be with you. Son has made the grave holy and a place of hope for your people. May we who die in his name also rise in him. We ask through the same Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. The lesson prescribed by the church for this morning's holy mass is taken from St. Paul's epistles to the Romans. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies, also through his spirit that dwells in you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Come, let us return to the Lord, for it is he who has torn, and he will heal us. He has struck down, and he will bind us up. If then we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Cleanse my heart and my lips, Almighty God, as you cleanse the lips of the prophet Isaiah with a burning coal. In your mercy, cleanse me so I may worthily proclaim your holy gospel through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Lord be in my heart and on my lips, that I may worthily proclaim his holy gospel. Amen. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Now a man was ill, Lazarus from Bethany, in the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who had anointed the Lord with perfumed oil and dried his feet with her hair. It was her brother Lazarus who was ill. So the sister sent word to Jesus, saying, Master, the one you love is ill. When Jesus heard this, he said, This illness is not to the end in death, but it is for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And so when he heard that he was ill, he remained there for two days in the place that he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jewish people are trying to stone you, and you want to go back there? And Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in a day? If one walks during the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light in this world. 
But if one walks at night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. And he said this and then told them, Our friend Lazarus is asleep, but I am going to awaken him. So the disciples said to him, Master, if he is asleep, he will be saved. But Jesus was talking about his death, while they thought he only meant ordinary sleep. And so then Jesus said to them clearly, Lazarus has died, and I am glad for you that I was not there, that you may believe. Let us go to him. So Thomas called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, Let us go and also die with Jesus. And when Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, only about two miles away. And many of the Jews had come out to Martha and Mary to comfort them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give it to you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise. And Martha said to him, I know he will rise in the resurrection at the last day. And Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, Yes, Lord. I have come to believe that you are the Messiah, the very Son of God, the one who is coming into the world. And when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary secretly, saying, The teacher is here and is asking for you. As soon as Mary heard this, she rose quickly and went to Jesus. For Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still where Martha had met him. So when the Jews who were with her in the house, comforting her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out, they followed her, presuming that she was going to the tomb to bear weep. When Mary came to where Jesus was, and she saw him, she fell at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her weeping as well, he became perturbed and deeply troubled in spirit and said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Sir, come and see. And Jesus wept. So, so the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not one who opened the eyes of the blind have done something so that this man would not have died? So Jesus, perturbed again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay across its entrance. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the dead man's sister, said to him, Lord, by now there will be a stench, for he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you to believe, and you shall see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus raised his eyes to heaven and said, Father, I thank you for hearing me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the crowd, I have said this, that they may believe that you have sent me. And when he had said this, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, tied, hand and foot with burial bands, and his face was wrapped in a cloth. And so Jesus said to them, Untie him and let him go. Now many of the Jews had come to Mary, had seen, and they had believed in him. This is the gospel of the Lord.
And Jesus began to weep. And this selection is taken from this morning's gospel according to St. John. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I imagine there may be more than a few Jeopardy fans among us this morning. And if you're ever watching and they ask what the shortest verse is in the Bible, well, you just heard it. And before there was a new Revised Standard Version of the Bible, there was just the Revised Standard Version of the Bible. And before that, there was the Standard Version of the Bible. And in the older translation, John 11.35 was even shorter. It was only two words. It said, Jesus wept. The chapters and the verses that we now find in the Bible, they originated only in the middle of the 16th century. But even so, for some 500 years now, we stand in a tradition that separated and highlighted those Greek words. Jesus wept with such an extraordinary statement. It was so shocking that it has stood alone for half a millennium. Jesus wept is part of the Lazarus story. John begins by telling us about Lazarus and linking him to his better known sisters, Mary and Martha. And it's just a little bit strange, but John distinguishes Mary from her sister by saying that Mary is the one who anointed Jesus' feet, but the reader of John's gospel, they don't know anything about that because that doesn't happen until the next chapter. So that's a little bit strange and the people could have been scratching their heads and, and this is really important, but it's too much to get into now. But in about a month's time, Bible class starts all over again and we're reading John's gospel. But anyway, back to today's sermon. Mary and Martha send a note to Jesus telling him that his friend Lazarus is deeply ill, that he's going to probably die. The three siblings are disciples of an extraordinary faith and they fully expect that Jesus will be able to heal Lazarus. And that's why they send that note. Jesus, however, intentionally delays and does not rush to their side. When Jesus finally arrives in the area, he hears that his friend, as he expected, has actually died. And as Jesus gets closer to the village, word of his approach reaches the two sisters who are grieving. When Martha hears that Jesus is near, she rushes out to meet him. If only you had been here, she mourns, then my brother would not have died. And this is a remarkable degree of faith in what Jesus could have done if he had just gotten there in time. And it keeps increasing until she actually declares, Jesus, you are the Son of God. Now, we're used to that kind of terminology. We've been Christians in this world for 2,000 years, and so Son of God is, is, it kind of just rolls off the tongue without any exception. But this is an absolutely remarkable theological statement for anyone who was living at the time of Jesus to call him the Son of God. So the Bible then tells us that Martha leaves and goes to get her sister Mary. Mary had also heard about Jesus' approach, but she decided to stay put where she was. She decided not to go out to see Jesus. So later, at her sister's insistence, she does go out to meet Jesus. She does kneel before Jesus in another act of extraordinary faith. But now, I'd like to ask you a question. I have something that I want you guys to think about because, you know, it is just my take on the story and it's only my opinion. So I'm asking you guys a question to think about. Why did Mary stay back when her sister first went out to meet Jesus? Why didn't she go? Do you think there's any chance that Mary was disappointed in Jesus? Both sisters have shown a remarkable amount of faith in Jesus. Both sisters believe that Jesus could have saved their brother if he got there in time. When Jesus does not come, does Mary grow angry with him? And this is why she refuses to go out to meet him? And does John, the evangelist, the gospel story writer, does he share that story with us for all of time, for all of Christian history? Because that is not an uncommon occurrence in any age. Do we still get mad at Jesus when bad things happen? When we think that Jesus could have done more and he didn't? Is that why this story is in the Bible? Again, that's something I'm asking you because I don't know. So still in that mode of asking some questions. Because, like I said, I'm not sure. Martha had said to Jesus, if only you had been here. And it sounds almost like, geez, Jesus, it's a shame, it's a pity that you weren't here because if you were here, you could have saved my brother. Mary says the exact same words as her sister when she finally comes out to Jesus. And I mean word for word. And because it's word for word, that's intentional. 
But when Mary says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, is it possible to hear those words as a statement of blame? Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died? And she weeps at Jesus' feet, maybe not only in despair, but is there also a little bit of disillusionment there? Now is when we hear that Jesus is both deeply moved and also greatly disturbed in spirit. And those are not the two same sentiments. Deeply moved can be the sorrow over Lazarus' death and the grieving of his two sisters, but greatly disturbed in spirit, that is something more. Is Jesus himself now troubled? Is Jesus himself even distressed over Mary's accusation that he did not care enough? Jesus has already seen an awful lot of pain and suffering in his life, but it is only at this point in the gospel story that we hear those two words, Jesus wept, Jesus cried. Was it the combination of being confronted with more suffering and then added on top of this the sight of looking down at Mary, crying at his feet, not only because of the death of her brother, but because of what Jesus had done, or more importantly, had failed to do for them? Did the accusation of indifference drive Jesus over the emotional threshold so that Jesus wept? Again, I don't know. But there needs to be a reason why John tells us that Mary stayed at home and why out of all of the stories, even this one that we're going to be talking about in just a couple of weeks, why in the world Jesus wept. Today is Passion Sunday. All of this is that message that Jesus does not have to be a part of our world. It is a time to consider the fact that Jesus was forced to go into hiding in order to prevent a premature death. He needed one final attempt away and alone with his closest followers to speak to them and try and convince them about what was going to happen and what they needed to do, and still they failed. The shrouds remind us that Jesus came to embrace the world, but that the world preferred not to be bothered by him. The shrouds remind us that it's our decision whether or not Jesus is a presence in our world, a little bit smaller our community, a little bit smaller our faith, a little bit smaller even in our lives. They also tell us that Jesus could have gone away. He could have slipped into seclusion and disappeared, not for a while. He could have disappeared for good. He could have avoided the cross. Instead, as we will remember next Sunday, he marches right back into Jerusalem with crowds of people proclaiming Hosanna to the son of David. And because he does that, he seals his faith, his fate, and he seals the fact that he's going to the cross. What I hope we can appreciate as we enter into the Passion Tide season of the church is Jesus' love for us is absolute, and it is absolutely unconditional. Even when we fail, even when we do this to him, Jesus still loves us. He did not abandon us even when we wished that he would just leave us alone. So we can never, ever take this for granted. And in this context, maybe we can ask to ourselves if there's any sort of a connection between this Passion Sunday narrative of Jesus' absolute love for us, and that is absolutely unconditional, in Mary's story of staying away. Because Passion Sunday is a message of people staying away. Does Jesus wept have any connection with Mary, not thinking that he loved her enough and with Passion Sunday's message that maybe Jesus is not as much a part of our world as he could be because people do not think, again, that he loves us enough, that he has done enough for us already. I don't know, but these last two weeks of Lent are a perfect time to think about the reason behind that standalone verse that Jesus wept and our relationship with him. Maybe this is something we can think about as we approach ever closer to that cross, a cross of perfect love. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>
We offer prayers for the soul of Anthony Ostrowski on the anniversary of his death, as offered by his granddaughter, Marianna Foster, and the Foster and Poe families. We offer our prayers for Henry Petrosky, whose anniversary of death was yesterday, April 1st of 1999, is offered by daughter, Marge Sanderson. We offer prayers in memory of Daisy Benjamin, who passed away on April 1st of, 19, of 2015, in loving memory, is offered by the Ahern, Benjamin, and Hubbard family. We also offer prayers in memory of Henry Vishniewski on the 14th anniversary of his death, is offered by Sharon, Kristen, Amanda, and myself. We offer prayers for Eddie Crockett, a high school friend, age 64, who passed away yesterday, is offered by Ellen Skrosky. We offer prayers for the soul of Janet Olthe, who passed away three days ago on Thursday, as submitted by Cindy Doty, a daughter-in-law, and their family. We also offer our prayers in memory of, father, of my father, Mary's grandfather, uh, Mario Thomas Sacco, who died 10 years ago on April 1st. Uh, may his strength and guidance be in our hearts always, as offered by Bridget. And we continue to offer our prayers for Liz Bridgman, battling cancer, raising three young girls on her own, Alex, a 16-year-old with lymphoma Hodgkin's disease, and Alicia, a young mother of three with stage four breast cancer, as offered by Cindy Benjamin. We offer our prayers for Frank Sprosky, as offered by Don, the Sprosky Gates and Kirkendall families. We offer prayers for Bishop Thomas Gannat's health and well-being and the strength of his wife Catherine, as offered by myself. And we also offer prayers for uh, Meg Connors, as offered by Ellen and Don Sprosky. Maurice Lizelle, as offered by myself. Richard Poe, as offered by the Poe and Foster families. And two-year-old Jack Soleil, as offered by Marianne Foster. And we also offer prayers for Frank Marshan, battle of cancer as well, as offered by the Sadowski family. Are there any other intentions that you'd like to offer at this time? For all of these prayers, Lord, plus the ones that we keep in the privacy of our own thoughts, uh, we also ask you, Lord, to bless each and every one of us here gathered. To also bless those who are parish who are unable to be with us here today, and on this Passion Sunday, the time to remember that sometimes it's easy to forget you. We pray for those who have chosen not to be with us here today. And for these things together, Lord, we pray by saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Thou who hast suffered wounds for us, Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord. May they rest in peace. May the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. <laughs> I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, Baker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made of one being of the Father. Through him all things are made for us, for our salvation. He came down from heaven, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he was born of the Virgin Mary, and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken to the Father. I believe in one holy Catholic apostolic church. I acknowledge one doctrine the forgiveness of sins. I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us 
us pray. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over these. We receive from your most sacred hand, most gracious Father, the sacramental bread. In the same faith and trust with the apostles and disciples of your Son and our Savior, when he said to them, I myself am going to bring them down.
which your holy church receives from you, imploring you to defend and guide her throughout the world, together with her priests and all true believers of the holy faith. Remember, Lord, your servant. this congregation, imbued with faith in your holy care, your rule and fatherly love, wholeheartedly this day, be united in spirit with all of them, we are the most blessed Mother Mary, Mother of Jesus Christ, likewise as apostles and with all the countless hosts of martyrs and confessors who lived, labored, and suffered for the same holy cause which Jesus Christ sacrificed his life and his most precious blood. Just as they believe, professed, and united with you through prayer in this immaculate oblation, which you have instituted from the beginning of the world, and in time have fulfilled through Jesus Christ, and gave it to humanity as the pledge of eternal salvation, so we too this day profess and unite ourselves with you, most gracious Father, in humbleness of spirit, and accept from your hands this holy bread and this precious chalice as a lot for gift bestowed on us by the Savior of the world as spiritual food and drink. He promised us this food and drink in that moment when he revealed his divine power by the multiplication of bread and feeding a hungry multitude of people. Afterward, he foretold the giving of that food and drink to his disciples and friends as a more excellent nourishment when he said, It is my Father who gives you the real heavenly bread. I myself am the living bread come down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he shall live forever. The bread I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. And afterwards, when the temporal and messianic life of the divine teacher and giver the covenant was drawing to a close, he gathered into the upper room all those he had loved in a singular way and had chosen to continue his work of salvation. He spoke to them words of deep love, longing, and resolve. I will not leave you orphaned. I will come back to you. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Do not be distressed or fearful. You will suffer in the world, but take courage. I have overcome the world. If you live in me, and my words stay a part of you, you may ask what you will, and it will be done for you. Anyone who loves me will be true to my word, and my Father will love him. We will come to him and make our dwelling place with him. I consecrate myself for their sakes now, that they may be consecrated in truth, that all may be one. As you, Father, are in me, and I in you, I pray that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, I have given them the glory you gave me, that they may be one as we are, I living in them, you living in me, that their unity may be made complete. Father, all those you gave me I would have in my company, where I am to see this glory of mine, which is your gift to me, because of the love you bore me before the world began. I myself am the bread of life. No one who comes to me shall ever be hungry. No one who believes in me shall ever thirst. After these and other words of the archpriestly prayer and with holy fervor, our Savior took bread to his holy and venerable hand, and having lifted his eyes to heaven, to you, his almighty Father, giving thanks to you, he blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat it, for this is my body, which is given for you. taking this excellent chalice into his holy and venerable hands, again he gave thanks to you, blessed it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant, which shall be shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Dear servants and your faithful people, in remembrance of this Christ, your Son and our Lord, as well as his blessed passion, resurrection, and his glorious ascension, we receive from your own gifts and presents a pure offering, a holy offering, an immaculate offering, the holy bread of eternal life, and the chalice of eternal salvation. These gifts we receive with a joyful countenance as from him who is the giver of all temporal and eternal good gifts, and with an unshakable faith they will become for our souls a saving remedy. We humbly ask you, Almighty God, to 
command and our offering be brought to the hands of your holy angels to your highest altar into the presence of your divine majesty. That we who receive the most sacred body and blood of your Son from this altar may be filled with every blessing and grace through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and who have passed on to eternity. To these souls, Lord, and to all who rest in Christ, grant everlasting life, and to those who are life straight in the path of righteousness, unmindful of your fatherly love, mercifully sure in their suffering. We ask in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, Amen. And grant us, your sinful servants, who hope in the greatness of your mercy, some part in fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs and all your saints, who shed their blood for your name. Their hearts are always open to justice and mercy, and with lives patterned after their divine Master, merited eternal joy. Number us in their company, Lord, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, Amen but whom you always create, sanctify, revive, bless, and freely give us all these good things. Through him, with him, and in him, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. Forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray, instructed by our Savior's teaching and following divine example, we say with confidence. Son of the living God, 
By the will of the Father and the work of the Holy Spirit, your death brought life to the world. By your holy body and blood, free me from all my sins and from every evil. Keep me faithful to your teaching, and never let me be parted from you, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. May the partaking of your body and blood, Lord Jesus, not be caused for my judgment. Though I am unworthy to receive this great sacrament, through your loving kindness may become my safeguard and healing remedy. My saving master awakened in me a living faith, fervent love, worship, adoration, and a holy love. Through this communion, make me your willing servant, zealous to fulfill your holy will. May it at last unite me entirely with you, my Lord and my God. Grant this who lives reigns with God the Father, in unity with the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. Amen. I will take the bread of heaven, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed. May the body of our Lord Jesus Christ bring me to everlasting life. Amen. Shall I return to the Lord for all the graces that he has given me? I will take the chalice of salvation, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. With high praise will I call upon the Lord, and I shall be saved from all my enemies. May the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bring me to life everlasting. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Lord, I am not worthy to see you, though we say the word, and I shall be patient. Body and the blood of Christ. 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 Body and the blood of Christ.
the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Glory be to you, Lord. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was in God's presence, and the Word was God. He was present to God in the beginning. Through him all things came into being, and apart from him nothing came to be. Whatever came to be in him found light, light for the light of men. The light shines on in darkness, a darkness that did not overcome. There was a man named John sent by God, who came as a witness to testify to the light, so that through him all might believe, but only to testify to the light, for he himself was not the light. The real light which gave light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and through him the world was made, yet the world did not know who he was. To his own he came, yet his own did not accept him. And he who did accept him, he empowered to become children of God. These are they who believe in his name, who were begotten not by blood, nor by carnal desire, nor by man's holiness, but by God. And the word became flesh, and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of an only Son coming from the Father, filled with enduring love. Thank mm -hmm. you. 